one of those students who attended that course, getting ready to study in Lagos, was the president, then Mr. Ekufuado. So some people go way back. And we all had a very good time here studying ideology before going to the University of Ghana. So really it's a pleasure to be part of this celebration since it also brings nostalgic memories. Human rights are important value based issues that have engaged the attention of the world for many years from time immemorial. From the abolition of slavery in the 1800s to the efforts to stop segregation in the 1900s, important efforts have been made by the civil rights movements across the world to tackle various aspects of human rights. And I want us to take note from the very beginning that human rights has been mutating over the eight areas and the dimensions have been varied. The emphasis has been different depending on the exigencies Aristotle wrote vehemently against slavery and opined that every human being is endowed by his or her creator with virtue. And there is no human being, no matter what race, who when exposed to virtue is not capable of attaining it. From Aristotle's thesis, the formulation data evolved. God made man, man made slaves. Series of human rights instru instruments have emerged from the United Nations and continental bodies such as the African Union, the with later Afri uh, first the Organization of African Unity, and every country has at least one core human rights treaty which we are all bound by. Ghana is a signatory to many UN charters, and our parliament has ratified many of the conventions. In Ghana, the 1992 constitution devotes an entire chapter, chapter five, to a litany of fundamental human rights and freedoms. Distinguished chairman, ladies and gentlemen, Conceptually, dozens of human rights treaties abound. If you turn to Chapter 5 of the Constitution, the rights of life, dignity, and property, which John Locke expounded, are well provided for. Political freedoms, the right to courts, political liberties, separation of the rights, uh, separation of powers, which Montesquieu expounded as the essence of liberty are all well provided for. But these declarations are manifestly not enough. And I refer to the theme of this year's celebration chosen by the organizers of this meeting, Stand Up for Human Rights. So it means there's something to stand up for. And it's not just a matter of having some provisions in a piece of paper. The UN's theme for the year says, leaving no one behind. Leaving no one behind. In this connection, I identify certain areas that we need to stand up for in contemporary terms. Because, for example, in current times, it is superfluous to speak about the right to independence for Africans. That one is already gone. 
when I was a boy, that was the first thing on the agenda, the quest for political freedom. In bringing them to contemporary terms, by applied conceptualization, therefore, these people will talk about the right of women in the political arena since they are being obviously left behind. Two, the rights of the vulnerable in society and <coughs> children. Three, the imposition of certain foreign practices on Africans by way of gay rights, supposed rights, which are not human rights, and the threat that if we do not comply, economic aid will be cut off. Ivy, the new world economic order of today, which makes Africans continue to be producers of raw materials at the periphery of the global economic order, while the developing nations remain firmly in the center of the global order. Our dilemma today is a sharp contradiction with this year's theme, leaving no one behind. Because in economic terms at least, you can see Africa has been and is being left behind. Starting from what? The rights of women. And Mr. Vice Chancellor, Chairman, I've deliberately stated that we cannot tackle the whole of the areas of human rights in one city. And it is important, therefore, to come to relevant issues of contemporary significance as some of the areas that we must address our minds to. It is rather unfortunate that efforts to use affirmative action to improve political representation in Ghana since 2007 have been fraught with challenges. But I'm optimistic that the narrative has to change and it will change. Last year, out of 193 countries examined by the Interparliamentary Union, IPU, as to poli women's political representation, our country was beaten by several other countries in the world on issues of women representation and affirmative action. This shows that we have a very long way to go as a country, and I hope this engagement brings about positive strides in achieving gender parity in our country. The representation of a 13% woman in our parliament attests to the fact that our political system is polarized and does not favor women. The good news is that we have the power to change this trajectory if only we have the political will. Our constitution mandates that all persons must be treated equally. Yet, what do we see today, even in the face of modern developments? Ladies and gentlemen, in countries like Tanzania, Uganda, Burundi, Sudan, Namibia, Kenya, Malawi, Mauritius, and Rwanda, women have been given a place of pride in the legislature and in local governance. And we have to do the same since Ghana is beaten to the very bottom of the global order. We need, therefore, to reinforce the role of our women. For that matter, a national affirmative action law is highly important to correct the gender disparity in our political, economic, and social endeavors. All women should be carried along in this process. No one should be left behind, and we should also extend protection for women to cover all vulnerable groups, including children and persons with disabilities. One of the most important problems facing us in this regard is that we see clearly that Article 17.1 of our 1992 Constitution provides clearly all persons shall be equal before the law. Article 17.2, no person shall be discriminated against 
on grounds of gender, race, color, ethnic origin, religion, creed, or social or economic status. And the constitutional provisions abound in that regard. This paper gives quite an introduction to the beginning of political participation in Ghana over the eras and shows that we are not getting anywhere by walking rather so slowly. The paper com compares what is happening in other parts of the world, both in Africa, Europe, etc. And it's very painful that even in Africa, we are terribly low at the ground point. Listen with ladies and gentlemen. The paper makes some recommendations as to how we can help to resolve this problem. And for example, it says, among other things, that a simple formula can be applied, as has been applied in some other countries, whereby political parties are made to present certain candidates as women candidates in a number of constituencies before they can qualify for the, for the election at all. Secondly, in some cases, as in Rwanda, when the elections are, are held gen generally, the whole country is also divided into what we call electoral areas. In, the, in Ghana, we may look at four district assemblies, for example, making an electoral area. And then, women who compete alone, women via women for seats. And if we have made provision for 50, for, for example, it will mean automatically that there will be 50 women who will come out of this process added to the other women who will come out of relations to give us a reasonable number of women in parliament. In some other countries, a similar, form, a simple formula has been applied in, in that at the end of an election, the number of seats reserved for women, let's say 50 again, will be allotted to the political parties, let's say MPP, NDC, will be allotted to the political parties to nominate women they consider capable and qualified as members of parliament in accordance with the percentage of votes a party obtains in that election. That alone automatically also will bring a certain number of women into parliament. Another thing that is available is that we realize that under the next national district assembly system, the president has the right and the duty to nominate one third of the members. It is also being suggested that these can be reserved for women as a way of supplementing the participation of women in um, politics as a whole. But one thing is that I love to say that if you prevent women from being, to, from, from participating effectively in politics, it is like denying the 51% of your own population the opportunity to participate. And it is like a person who has two legs running in a race, who prefers to tie one leg behind him or her and then run only on one leg, that person, of course, will not succeed. And that is exactly the kind of system we, we, we bring upon ourselves when we fail to utilize the abilities of people who are part and parcel of society. We also look at the rise of children and women and the vulnerable in society. And this is very, 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 very important and current. And it is important to mention that there are, these are real issues plaguing Africans. And if the United Nations is really concerned about our human rights, they should pay serious attention to sickle cell sufferers, street children, the thousands of lives lost due to infant, infant mortality, high cost of dialysis treatment for kidney failures, women delivering on the bare floor, children suffering from kwashiorkor, abject poverty, inaccessibility to expensive medication, 
and even AIDS, even before they were born. These are the plaguing human rights issues, current, real, and obvious in our society today. And we cannot celebrate Human Rights Day without seriously interrogating ourselves on some of these maladies and how best to cure them. This thing was, ladies and gentlemen, is it right for children to be taught, for example, to call a, a, a mommy who actually is a man? Because these days, we all know about some of the tendencies of bringing some of the European ideas, foreign connotations of what is family, what is sexuality, and other matters that have really given some concern recently in our country, for example. And that brings us to the whole concept of homosexuality, which has become an important issue for some people because they have given it the nice nomenclature of being a human right. And I, 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 I honestly do not accept this connotation of human rights. It's a human... I have seriously interrogated some of the arguments that have been made. That some people are born with hormonal deficiencies. They are born with a physical defect. They are born with a problem. That is true. But you see, you don't solve a problem by turning it into a right. Some people are pedophiles. And they are born that way. Some people are kleptomanic. They are born that way. So you don't turn that into a right. Otherwise, everybody will go into a shop and steal and say, I'm kleptomanic. <laughs> it's not a right. It's a problem. But it doesn't mean that you are going to amputate the person's hand or any such thing. And in homosexual terms, amputate a sexual organ. No, no, no. In fact, our constitution forbids that kind of treatment. But nevertheless, it's a problem. And you solve it medically or psychologically or you may seek redemption in the church in the final result. So those persons may also, if naturally, they are human beings and they want to treat them like any other disease. And it is important, particularly since young people are here, for me to add some of my strong views on this matter. Because what is even more dangerous, now the homosexuals are seriously organizing, lobbying, and working as an organization, a global lobby, in order to get what they want. Therefore, our younger ones must be schooled against this. Since they have got huge sums of money, even to the extent that they will threaten African governments that if you do not en engage in this act or accept it, we are going to cut off it. Is that a human rights issue? It is punitive and inhuman. In fact, when that happened some time ago, I wrote a letter to the British Prime Minister telling him he did not know what he was saying. Because as for Ghanaians, we are not going to take Chess is a, a technical expression. We are not going to take chairs and sit and they say, meaning we are going to have a marriage. And then family A is here and family B is there facing each other. 
and then somebody comes with the bridegroom and he's got a beard. And then another comes with the bride, he's got a mustache. We shall not admit that into the corridors of human rights. And that decent nomenclature to veil that which is unacceptable must be eschewed by all freedom lovers. This series, ladies and gentlemen, I will leave you with a copy of my paper. I'm speaking only to it. So long as we are in an academic society, the full paper will be available both in software and in hardware the moment we leave this place. In fact, I took great interest in coming to give this lecture today. It reminds me of my days in academia, of course, at least. And I must thank the organizers particularly for recognizing my human rights of going to preside over parliament before coming. And that is why I've come at this particular time. Yes, we are My last point will be on the new world economic order as a, as a contemporary human rights issue. Some time ago, and I said, I said this from the beginning, that human rights has got different emphasis at different age, stages. Uh, in people's lives. Some time ago, the prime focus in Africa was the fight against colonization. After independence, the emergence of the dictatorship and militarism and governance challenges in myriad forms turned the world's attention to a search for good governance leading to the second world of change. That time, we were all fighting military dictatorship. And in fact, politics in Ghana, 72 to 79, was a reaction, my personal reaction, to military dictatorship, which I have heard. So you will see that the human rights fight changes from time to time according to the exigencies of the time. And today, in this modern world, when we talk about human rights in the world, especially the Western nations, the developed nations of the world have to seriously consider how to help the whole world to rise to the challenge of one climate change. Because climate change is affecting so many things, health, food, clothing, shelter, disasters, etc. And it is a challenge to our right to live on this planet. Therefore, this is a day also when we must not just celebrate, but we should consider the real dynamics of climate change. Secondly, we should consider nuclear race and the threats that that poses to the whole world. While children are suffering with Kwashioko and their human right to life, liberty, are affected, billions of do do uh, dollars are spent between the United States and Russia in particular that really do not meet the eye. This must be interrogated because those who seek to really promote equality, fairness, justice, the welfare of humanity generally and globally must examine the inequalities of these expenditures vis-a-vis -vis the suffering of humankind as a whole. And finally, poverty, misery, and disease which stem out of the old economic paradigm of dependency, which is recycling poverty in this effect. 
a situation which seriously undermines the human rights of so many people in this world. So as you will see in my paper, I talk about global warming in these circumstances. I also speak about the nuclear risk and its effects. But my main interest is the world economic order itself, where the developing nations essentially produce raw materials and the developed nations produce and export finished products to Africa. This economic paradigm is a continuum, I say, of the old colonial order, which continues to persist. Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, for example, produce 60% of the world's cocoa, but receive less than 10% of the end products of global income. By the existing World Trade Organization, that is WTO framework, the free movement of goods globally leads to a dumping onto African markets cheap products of all kinds. The result is that infant African industries are adversely affected and stifled up in issue. Notably, industrialization was not achieved if you study world economic history, was not achieved in any nation without protectionist measures to protect the local infant industry. I want to emphasize this point. A serious study of global economic history reveals in very clear terms whether it was Britain, whether it was Russia, whether it was China, India, Japan, Korea, wherever I stand for any challenge where the doors were open, there was a libertarian approach as in the present World Trade Organization order against Africans and they developed their industries. There is none. Our fruits, for example, need to be applied to processing into juices and vegetables into paste, 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 for example, so as to avoid glut in peak season and import in late seasons. But before the local industry can compete, it must be protected from cheap brands dumped from a number of nations. Let us consider our one industry, one factory. And let us consider around this area where you have a lot of oranges and other things. And where you are being able to produce those uh, things into uh, fruit juices. Coming really to basics. How do you start and how do you effectively compete with all those finished products on the market? Before you start, you are dead. This is a, a human rights challenge. And yet, the WTO arrangements makes it very difficult for you to stop the inflow of products into your country. When President Kufo was president, and he sought to limit the inflow of American chicken and made an order in that connection, there was a serious bombardment from the United States of America. In the end, the president, for many other good reasons, had to withdraw the protectionist measures. This is exactly what I'm talking about. So if the chicken industry in Ghana is what it is today, it is because of these determinants. And it is unfair. It is unjust. It is discriminatory in this part of the world. 
And this is why human rights means re-examining the global world economic order. There is a dilemma here. Our products can only be translated into finished products if we can avoid setting competitive inflow into our countries. In fact, I remember very well at that time when we, we, we had an issue with regard to this chicken. I happened to be in cabinet then as Minister for Energy. Ghana argued, among other things, that chicken from America had too much fat content, which is also true. Which may be good for people in that climate, but which was dangerous for people, particularly in the tropics. No one will listen. Big muscles were flexed and we caved in. Nana Adudankwa Akufuadu, our president, is vigorously pursuing a policy of free senior high school. One district, one factory. One village, one dam. It is a viable economic policy to produce for the local market. Apart from, of course, the attendant right to education, which means all our children should go to school. Personally, it pains my heart as a boy who developed in Asimankesi, who grew up there, a girl boy in Asimankesi. I knew all the trajectories of life by way of seeing classmates, and in my time, 95% of those in school walked barefoot to school. And that was the order of the day. And long distances, scorching sun, but we were used to it. I had the privilege of enjoying not walking barefooted. The credit is going to my parents, particularly my father. But I saw how people passed with full scholarship and could not go to secondary schools. And I'm therefore 100% in support of free senior high school education. <laughs> if you haven't seen anything before, then when you have the opportunity to go to secondary school, you sit at home and say, they are lowering standards. Whose standards are being lowered? They are going part-time, uh, 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 double uh, entry, whatever. But if it, gives, if it gives double our youth the opportunity to be exposed to secondary schools, it's a way of solving a problem. And great minds must find ways and means of providing in the solution. Men like Professor Namwa, who this hall was named after. So those, <laughs> yes, there's a problem. But those who love Ghana, they dare not say we are criticizing the good thing. Rather, they should say we are going to find a solution to all the problems attendant to free senior high school education for Ghanaians. So distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as I have said, we have to con contemporize this issue, bring it in contemporary terms. The things that touch and concern us today, because Ghana, with all our abundance in gold, diamond, bauxite, manganese, Cocoa, timber, now oil, etc. We need to be able to develop these in a manner that will best suit us. And when Ghana Beyond Aid is being talked about, this is the conceptualization.
That is, we must seek partnership of mutual development that will bring us all together to promote our human rights for the benefit of our children and for us to benefit from all our natural resources in a manner that will be equalitarian for us all. Enablement for the upliftment and benefit of all nations. In short, treaties of economic justice which realign the global economy, the management of this global economy, and ensuring equitable development. When this is delivered, then we can say, as indeed is the theme that you have chosen, and also is allied to the global theme, equality for all human beings, no matter the circumstances. God made man. Man made slaves. The inequalities which affect human rights are the creation of human beings. We need to realign and look for a new social, political, economic paradigm that will make us really enjoy our human, race, human rights equitably and to the fullest possible. I thank you all for your